This is a high CRI light. <laughs> We're gonna bust some myths today. I have a new book out, by the way, called Real Cinematographers Don't Still Live With Mommy and Sit In Gaming Chairs. <laughs> Just kidding. I love cheap stuff from China. And I love playing with shop lights from Home Depot. And I laugh when every now and then someone leaves a comment saying, what's the CRI? I only use LEDs with high CRI values for the best color rendering accuracy possible. I laugh at them. <laughs> I laugh at them because saying LED and CRI means they have no clue what they're talking about. First of all, if you want the best color rendering accuracy possible, you wouldn't even be using LEDs in the first place. And secondly, you wouldn't be saying CRI. These people have been brainwashed by YouTube. CRI stands for Color Rendering Index, and that was designed over half a century ago to compare fluorescent lights with natural sunlight spectrum and HID lights, which stands for high-intensity discharge, like this, you know, the kind that could get so hot they could burn your house down. <laughs> Those are the real lights that were used in Hollywood, and they still are. Nowadays, manufacturers are using this old system called CRI to sell their lights, making you think that the higher the CRI value is, the better the light is, and the more accurate their lights are, right? This light has a high CRI value, and so does this. Does this look like faithful reproduction of sunlight or tungsten? There's better ways of testing lights anyway, so today we're going to do just that. We're going to be testing all kinds of lights using the Seikonic C800 with all kinds of LED lights. We're going to compare them with some old school tungsten lights like this or this. Don't laugh. I'm going to blow your mind because today you're going to see why real Hollywood still uses real tungsten and HMIs if they want the best color possible not YouTubers who like to call themselves cinematographers with their little RGB lights. Sorry, but if you want the best skin tones and color, nothing beats the real thing. Now before you say, but Marcus, you've got thousands of LEDs. That's all you've been showing us. Yes, I know. I love them. In fact, I like using ones that other people laugh at. I want to see what I can get away with using the cheapest, most lightweight plastic stuff from China possible because it's fun and it's YouTube. If I was doing a multi-million dollar production, I would be using more serious equipment. And yes, I know there are movies using LED lights, but there are also lots of uncompromising movies being made with those who want the very best color possible. It's a matter of taste and budget and how much time you have to get the shot. But don't worry, I'm going to show you how you can fix the color of cheap lights and where they can look pretty good on YouTube. And by the way, it's not just a matter of adjusting white balance, it's a little bit more than that. Now a full CRI chart has 15 colors, but when manufacturers sell their product, they only use the first eight. This is called the RA score, and if you look closely, what do the first eight colors have in common? That's right, they're all pastel colors. All the reference hues used to calculate CRI or RA are desaturated, which does not translate well to real world conditions where there are strong saturated colors. The one that affects skin tones the most is R9, which isn't even in the first eight, which is strong red, and red is important because you got blood underneath your surface, and that's what makes makes all skin tones look like skin tones. And the R9 is not even included in the manufacturer's CRI numbers. You could have a CRI of 90 something and an R9 value of 20 or less, which is horrible if you don't like looking like a swamp creature from Dawn of the Dead. If you want good skin tones, you need a high R9 value. It's also needed to make food and wood look good. So if you're a food photographer and you want the mouth-watering colors, don't use LEDs if you can. LEDs are not just weak in producing true reds, but almost all of them have this, a nasty, huge blue spike on the left, almost every single one. This is the trademark giveaway of an LED. Here's another problem. You see that yellow mound in the middle? That means there's a lot of yellow and what happens when you mix yellow? yellow and blue, that's right, you get green. Even though the green part of the spectrum isn't that strong, you get a nasty yellow green look with a lot of LEDs because that annoying blue spike is visually mixing with the yellow and sometimes you get this, a bizarre rogue spike somewhere in the mix. And the only way to calm something like that is surgically taking down that part of the spectrum using curves in your editing software. Maybe I'll show you how to do that in another video. Anyway, you could calm the blue spike, but then you'd be also dulling down your precious blue and purple RGB background. No! There are better ways of testing your LEDs. Obviously, a color meter like the Siconic C800 is the pro way of doing that. This is $1,700, so most people will never get it. But those same people, ironically, will go get a $1,700 lens because they want a blurry background. So that means, oh, a blurry background is more important than not having skin tones from The Walking Dead. Okay. Anyway, if you ever get one of these, you'll be spending days playing with it. This has so many features, it's mind-boggling. What a toy, especially for nerds. 
All right, so let's see what true tungsten light looks like. Again, this is a tungsten light. I've still got some left over from my Hollywood days. These are, you're gonna laugh, I know you're laughing. You're laughing at these, right? Because these look, these are dinosaurs compared to what you're using. Well, all right. Let's get out the old Seikonic CA-800 here and see what it looks like. This is what a pattern looks like from the first light I held up. CRI of 99.9. .9. Wow, the R9 is 99.8. Nothing beats this baby. All right, let's take away these LEDs and put a tungsten light in its place. Now, you cannot use a tungsten light with a softbox. So, the, what you use is, you can use diffusion gel which is fireproof it doesn't burn it melts or something like this a fireproof silk uh, diffuser of some kind but you do but it needs to be several feet away from the light so the light shines through it you back it up enough so it fills the whole thing and then you have your diffusion so to keep that in mind and also if you do start experimenting with tungsten lights, I'm not kidding, you should have a fire extinguisher around. <laughs> I remember I got a, I, a water spill on my carpet a long time ago, and I used the um, towels to soak up the, the water as much as I could, but then I used a, a tungsten spotlight to shine on the spot, and it dried it up really good. <laughs> yeah, you could, you, I actually use these sometimes to warm up the room in the wintertime when it was too cold. These things are really, they get hot fast. So anyway, but the lighting, not, nothing beats the tungsten. So let's put these in here and see what it looks like. Okay, the first thing you notice is the background turned blue. That's because those are still daylight balanced lights. Only these front two lights that are on my face are tungsten. So I balance for that with the light meter. And by the way, look how clean that looks. Look at that. It's <laughs> so, wow. And these are a couple of Lowell Tota lights. These are great portable little tungsten lights. You can get a bunch of them packed in a very small space. They're very portable. The downsides to tungstens are they get super hot. You can't touch them for 10 minutes after using them. You need pliers to be able to just move anything on those things. You need gloves or pliers. And they don't have a knob that goes from zero to 100. And you can get a dimmer, a heavy duty dimmer to make them go up or down. Uh, but they don't come with them or use nets or which is basically different levels of black fly screen which dulls which lowers the light level anyway but, but these are the low total lights if you're going to use tungsten these are great little lights to use but these are not lights for youtubers doing vlogs out of their little spare bedroom and they can catch the house on fire they get very hot they're very unwieldy uh, you're you're, you're going to be sweating like crazy after a while uh, the power bill goes through the roof. It's, this is for Hollywood. This is not for YouTubers. Anyway, so everybody's using LEDs now. So let's get some crappy LEDs that are, the color is just horrible and let's fix them. And I'll show you how, because that's really the most practical thing in today's video, isn't it? Let's find out. All right, so here we have a couple of cheap LEDs. They produce a nice soft light. I'm going to cover these in an upcoming video because I kind of like them but the light is kind of greenish cyan kind of sickening looking Blech. so how do we fix this well the first way to fix it the easiest way is to white balance the camera and that is you get my typical my marcus patented crumpled piece of white paper you zoom in on the thing and you do a white balance adjustment all right that's better that's much better now this is people think when you do a white balance adjustment that it's just a color temperature difference from 3000 to 7000 it's not. That's just a straight line from yellow to blue. But if you look underneath here, see where it says M2? That's a tint adjustment. That's from magenta to green. Is red to green or yellow to blue. The M2, that means magenta 2. Two levels of magenta. Now it can do different levels. It can do like 0.75 or 1.25. But in this case, it required two whole levels of magenta to make the green go away. This is a little RX100 pocket camera. Most Sonys have this on there. I don't know what all the other camera brands, how they show it, but there's two adjustments. One is the yellow to blue, which is what most people think of when they think of white balance. And the second one is the tint adjustment. All right, now I made the adjustment with the color meter. How does this compare with the camera? A lot of times the color meter is more accurate than a camera because it's just more accurate. That's what these are for. So this adjustment is made with the color meter. 
This says 6035, so I set it at 6,000 instead of 5,900, and uh, adjusted the M level also. This thing is so great, it'll tell you how to do anything. For example, you could gel these lights, but what gel do you use? Well, you make a reading with this thing, and it'll tell you right away what to use. This is, it said, Lee filter. You can pick your brand of filter. This is Lee filter. This is the filter, the gel that you use. But let's say you don't want to use gels. Let's say you want to make an adjustment in your camera. This will tell you what adjustment to make. Let's say you have RGB lights. Take a reading of the crappy light, and it'll tell you, make this adjustment in the hue, in the saturation, and you can dial it in with your RGB lights, and uh, because almost all RGB lights are still a little bit off. They're not perfect. They still got a little bit of that green and blue, so this will help you tell you what hue and saturation adjustment to make on your RGB lights. This thing is invaluable. This thing is so great, it's addictive. I can't stop playing with it. It'll help you with anything. It'll help do your laundry and your dishes. It's just amazing. Now I know some of you are gonna say, why don't you just use a color picker and shoot in raw and fix it in post? Sure, you could do that if you like huge file sizes and rendering times and doing all this work after the fact. I like getting it right in the camera right away and I've got nothing else to do. I'm done. But that's just me. You go right ahead. LEDs are really cool though. I mean, they're cheaper, smaller, more lightweight, easier to use, they're fun, they don't get real hot and cause fire as much, and you can get RGB colors. And if you're, all you're doing is YouTube videos, you don't need absolutely perfect color rendering anyway. It's just YouTube. I mean, as long as you're close enough and you don't look green or pale or dead. <laughs> So naturally, I nerded out and color tested all my lights, and I'll put a list down below in the description box if you're curious. Remember, the RA value is what manufacturers use for the CRI score. R9 is the one that's important for skin tones, so I have that value in there also. The RA and R9 scores are different when you adjust your lights from 5600 to 3200, so I'll have both the 3200 RA and R9 values and the 5600 RA and R9 score. Some lights do better at 3200, some lights do better at 5600. Some were so bad, they not only had no red at all, they actually had minus 4.7 red, for example. I didn't even know that was possible. Remember, a light can have a high CRI score, but look green or cyan like this. Here's a FIU FD100. It has a CRI of 97.9, but look at the spectrum. It's a little high in the cyan and green when it's set at 5600. This is what real sunlight looks like. You can see the difference when you overlay them in SSI on the meter. And again, if you change the 3200 on this light, it gets much better. RA is 98. 8.5, the R9 is 92, and it's very good spectrum. So this light is better for being used at 3200 than 5600. Now there's better tests, obviously, in the CRI, like the TM30, which uses over 99 values, not just 15. Obviously, the spectrum is good, and the SSI is helpful because it shows you how your light compares with true daylight or tungsten. That's really cool. The best overall test results I got from my testing was, like, for example, the Zhiyun X100. It had an RA of 98.1 at 5600 and an R9 of 97.7 at 3200. The G60 was really good. The X60 was a little on the blue side. The Godox ES30 panel was really good. My favorite on-camera light, the ID10 was really good. The Inky lights were great, an RA of 97.2 and an R9 of 94.6. And believe it or not, the Neewer CL124 light wand had an RA of 98.5 and a daylight R9 of 90.4. The Westcott bulb was great for daylight in soft boxes. That's what I'm using right here. I got two Westcott bulbs in these soft boxes. That's what I use for most of my soft boxes. Really, really good. And believe it or not, a lot of the daylight LEDs that come with an orange plastic cover to make it 3200, that orange plastic actually produces pretty good results. Some lights have dedicated 3200 LEDs like the Bolt Core SWX, which has pure daylight LEDs and pure 3200 LEDs mixed together. And you can mix between the two to get your bicolor. If you have it all the way to orange, the R9 is 90. 99.8, wow. Another one that had great results is the VidPro 530. This is what this one is. It's uh, just a little basic flat box, really good results. I might make a video about this in a few weeks. I really like this one. Now, I know these are not as perfect as true halogen or tungsten or HMI lights, but I love LEDs and I have thousands of them. I don't care because it's just YouTube. But if you really want the best skin tones and want the best color accuracy rendering possible, try a real tungsten light. You know, I mean, don't laugh at these. Try it. Try a real tungsten light. You might be surprised. A whole new world will open up to you.